Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Jim and this uh, video is going to be about common beginner issues that I've experienced. So a lot of these are things that I've experienced myself, but also over the last few years I've come across quite a few different projects and these are also some things that I see in a lot of other people's projects as well. So hopefully you learned something from this video and let's get to the first one. Overuse of event tick. So this is actually a big one. I think people see the event tick and they just think I'll throw everything on there and everything will just get processed and uh, I won't have to worry about it. Now, the problem with this is that putting something on the event tick means that whatever functionality you put there is going to fire every single frame. Now, you can change it within a class to lower the tick rate, but generally you don't want something ticking constantly. What we want to do is fire functions when we need them. And the problem here is that having lots of functionality on the event tick can actually really cause reduction in your performance of your game. So we want to keep as many things off of there as possible. It's not that you need to have nothing on there, but really you need to use it sparingly. So some tips on how to reduce your use of event tick. We can use timers. Uh, we can use retriggerable delays, which uh, I'll show you both of those. And then in a pinch, you can also reduce the tick interval. So a common place where I see people using event tick is that they will have some type of health regeneration function so that every frame that their health is not full, it's just going to constantly tick up. So what I've done here is I've set up a widget that just shows the health and the text of the health. And we're going to add that to viewport. I've created a health component, which is what we're going to use to track health. There's a function in there called refill health, which will just set it to the max health right at the beginning of begin play. And then in our event tick here, we have one function called can fill health. And really all this is doing is seeing if the current health is less than the maximum health. And if it is, then we can fill. And then if we can fill, then we're going to take our current health and we're going to increment it. And we're going to do this every frame with the tick. And the last bit of setup that I just want to show is that I have this damage volume in my scene. It's this big red box. And when we overlap it, we're going to do damage. It's going to do 100 damage, which actually is the amount of health that our character can have. So when we are dealt damage, we're just going to decrease our current health by that amount. And then our event tick is going to fill it back up. So let me just show a quick demo of how this works. So here we are, we can see that we have 100 health, which is our max health. And when we go into this, it drops it down to zero and then it will fill back up. And I can do it again and again. Now, there's a few problems with this. One is that um, we can control the tick rate, so we can go to our class settings. We can set our tick interval. So when it's set to zero here, that just means fire every frame. Let's do 0.2, so we're gonna fire five times per second. And we can see when we do this, it is slowed down drastically, but the problem is we still don't really have any control over it. So let's say for instance, we wanna have some type of delay. So after you get damaged, then there may be a delay until the health starts to fill up again. Well, in this, it's gonna get pretty messy because we're gonna have to create probably a boolean that says recently damaged and then how do we turn that off so it's going to get messy real quick so even though we've reduced the interval we still need some extra functionality here to get control over it so here what i've done is i've actually just disconnected that from the event tick and i created a new custom event called refill health that uses the same bool to see if we can re refill the health and then i'm doing a set timer by function name and the function that we're going to use is called increment health, which I have here. And basically, again, it's going to check, can we fill health? If we can, then we're going to increment that health like we were doing before. If we can't, then we're going to clear the timer. And one thing to note, we just need to make sure that we're calling our event on damage. So after we're damaged, it's going to check, can we fill the health? 
and then it will start to fill. Here we are back in our scene and I'm going to hit the volume and we can see that it has the exact same functionality. And when we get to 100, the timer should clear because then our health is full and we no longer need to fill it. And we saw the little debug message there that said timer cleared. So the benefit of it doing it this way is that then we have much more control over what's happening. It's not firing every single tick. It's not firing every frame. So we have more control over when it is actually being fired. And I just want to show one more functionality here. If we clear timer by function name right after our damage, what that's going to do is it's going to clear any active timer that's already started. And then we can do a retriggerable delay let's just say this delay is one second. So we're gonna wait for one second before we refill health. And the cool thing about a retriggerable delay, as it says here, is that if you call it again, it resets. So every time we get damaged, this delay is gonna reset and it won't start filling up until the delay has, has finished. So let's actually set it to two seconds just so we can get a full representation. And if I go into the health it takes two seconds and then it will start to fill now what I can do here is actually do it twice three times and now it'll start to fill after that two seconds so every time I went back in there it restarted it the next common mistake that I see is the overuse of the delay node now Delay nodes can be used sparingly. I use them from time to time when there's not something better or in a pinch if I'm just trying to prototype something quickly. But in almost every situation, a timer is going to be better. And technically, if you look under the hood, a delay node is just a timer programmed in C++. So one of the problems of a delay node is that once you start it, you have no control over it. It's going to finish every single time. Whereas a timer has lots of other functionality. You can set a timer, you can pause a timer, you can unpause a timer, you can clear a timer. There's many things that you can do with a timer to give you extra control. Whereas the delay, once it starts, it's going to finish and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And to demonstrate this delay, I've created a delay actor. And basically how this actor works is when we overlap, we have a delay of two seconds, it's going to print goodbye, and then it's going to destroy itself. So let's check this out. So if I walk into this blue box, it's going to start a timer, two seconds, del destroy itself, say goodbye. Now the problem with this is that once that starts, I, I have no control over it. It's going to do that every single time. So to fix this, what I've done is I've created a function called goodbye, when it's going to print a string goodbye player and then destroy itself. And we'll see that this time is set to two seconds, which is the same as the delay that we had last time. So if we compile this, we'll see that it has the exact same functionality. Two seconds, destroy itself, goodbye player. Now, what's the difference? Why would we want to use this? Why does anyone care? Well, let's say we wanted to have something like if the player can get back out of the box within that two second window, it won't destroy itself. And we can use a timer for this functionality. We can clear the timer if the player leaves the box. And for that, I've set up this end act, or event actor end overlap with clear function by name goodbye. So if we leave the box before the two seconds is over, it will clear that function and then we can just keep trying it. So here we are back in our game and we'll go into the box, but we'll leave within the two seconds and we can see that it doesn't go away as long as I can get out of it within that two seconds. It doesn't fire, but if I stand in there for two seconds, then it will fire. So this can be really good for setting up events in your scene or setting up functionality on your player where you need some type of delay, you need some type of timer, but we don't want to use a delay because we lose all of that extra control that a timer gives us. So the next thing that I see a lot is overuse of casting. Now, casting takes up a lot of resources. 
so it should be used sparingly. Similarly, get all actors of class or get actor of class is another culprit where if we're firing this constantly, for instance, on a tick, then we're gonna be casting every single frame and we're gonna be doing the same thing every time. So to get away from this, we can use a variety of things. We can use components, interfaces, event dispatchers, in place of casting when possible. And then if casting absolutely cannot be avoided, we can always cache those objects as a variable. So to demonstrate this, I set up a little bit of a function here. Now, it's pretty common to need to cast to the game mode or game instance or player controller to get access to some functionality in there. But if we're doing it on the event tick, for instance, then every time we have a tick, we're going to cast to the game mode. Then we're gonna use this functionality, which for this case, I just did something simple like printing the screen. But if we had a lot of functionality here, we'd be doing that on every single tick. And to show you what this looks like, I'm gonna hit play and we can see that every single tick, we are printing game mode to the screen. But that also means we're casting to game node to get the access to the name. So how do we get around it? Well, what I've done here is I will connect this cast to begin play, and then I can pull off this little button here. And this, you'll notice that there's an option to promote to variable. And when I do that, it creates a setter and it says set as BP game mode. Now I can gain access to this variable and then pull my print string directly off the tick. And then hook this up and now we'll get our display name. And we can see that this has the exact same functionality. So a good thing about this is although we're getting the same functionality, we're avoiding that cast every frame, which is a key part of uh, imp improving the performance. And as we know, or if, if you watch my other video and we talk about these base classes, we know that every time we load a scene, the game mode is loaded and it stays persistent as long as we're in that level. So there's really no harm in caching this variable, specifically game mode, because we know it's never gonna change as long as this player persists in the world. The next thing I wanna talk about is improper use of the Unreal Engine based classes. Now, I made a whole nother video about this, so I won't spend too much time on it, but these are just a few of the ones that I see a lot of beginners not really understanding the concept of. So your game mode really should handle all of the rules within a level, so think of it as the referee in a sports game, or if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, this is kind of like the dungeon master, really just making sure that everything's following the rules of the game. The player controller, this is used to hold player controls, regardless of what pawn is being controlled. If you've ever used any of the Unreal Engine templates, you notice that a lot of times they'll put the controls directly into the character. Now, arguably there's not anything wrong with this. Some maybe even argue it might be a better path, but what I say is that control should go in the controller. So anything that is going to be controlling your player should go in the player controller. If you wanted to have specific controls for a certain pawn, you could put those into that pawn's uh, blueprint. But for the most part, any player controls should go in the player controller class. The next one is the game instance. Now, I bring this one up mainly because this is instantiated every time the game is launched and it stays persistent as long as that instance of the game remains open. So this really is an underutilized class for beginners because this is where you can keep persistent data. Anything you wanna be transferred between levels, you would wanna save those as variables to your game instance. And this is where saving and loading is handled, especially if you're using the built-in functionality of save and load in Unreal Engine. And the last one here is a component. Now a component is any piece of pre-built functionality and it can be added to a scene or an actor. And the reason I bring this one up is because a lot of things that I see put onto characters can actually be broken out into components and that way they can be reused. So for instance, we created a health component in one of the projects that I showed and that allows me to add that to any class in the game that I want to have a health variable. And then we can make functions in there like take damage, fill health, and then any class that has health just automatically will have access to those functions. And that's it for this video. Hopefully you learned something. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop something in the comments. If there's a specific video you would like to see, please feel to drop that in the comments as well. 
I will try to keep making these videos as much as my schedule allows. Thanks for watching.